uh, travel agents, tours, tour operators and airlines have all come under fire in recent weeks for not adhering to this 14 day refund rule. Although it's obviously different for airlines as well. Um, they've got a less uh, smaller time frame to refund within. Um, some have sided with consumers. Some have been particularly vocal within the industry. They've accused businesses of breaking the law. Others have pleaded for leniency and for more time to save both their businesses and the jobs of their staff. So where does the sector go from here? What needs to happen to win back consumer trust? And crucially, how will the industry change as a result as we emerge from this crisis? So hi, all of you, and thanks to everyone for joining us uh, here today. Just to remind everyone, I am joined by Gary Lewis, Chief Executive of the Travel Network Group, Joanne Dewey, President of the Scottish Passengers Agents Association and owner of independent agency Love to Travel, which has three shops based in Coatbridge, Motherwell and Bells Hill, North Lanarkshire, and John Bevan, CEO B2B of Donata. So thanks again to all of you for joining me here today. Uh, we've decided to close today's seminar with a really frank discussion uh, about the issue which seems to be really dividing the sector at the moment at a time when many would argue it really should be more united than ever if the sector is to survive the next few months. So I'm talking, of course, of the great refund debate uh, and where the sector goes from here. So just to kick the discussion off, um, it would be really interesting to hear from each of you what your views are on the, the current refund issue. Are you frustrated that the government has failed to amend the PTRs after having suggested it would? Or do you share the views of some more vocal people in the travel industry that perhaps it's right that the PTRs haven't been amended? Um, Joanne, should we start with you and your thoughts? Yeah, um, I am very frustrated that the PTRs have not been amended. Um, I genuinely, I know we have got a duty of care to our customers, and yes, when we can get this money through and these customers want a cash refund, we will do everything possible to give them it. But you can't give them what you don't have. And I, I, I just wish they had relaxed them for this situation, because this is something we've never experienced before. Um, I listened to Mark, Mark Tanzer today um, with the Select Committee and I thought he was excellent um, in what he asked for. Um, and yet, if the government aren't going to relax them, are they going to help the trade to give these customers that money back if we don't have it? Mm. Um, so, yes, I am frustrated about it and I am not on the camp of that we should be fighting for people to get the 14 days. But, you know, in any other circumstances, of course, that's what we would be looking for. But in this circumstance, we need to fight to save our industry. Yeah. You know, there's thousands and thousands of people's jobs at risk here, and the travel industry is totally at risk. And if we don't all stand united fighting for it, then I'm sorry, but we will not have the industry that we all love. Yeah. So I am very much on the fence of we should have relaxed them. Great. Thanks, Joanne. Uh, John, what's your opinion on this? So, well, First of all, of course, our thoughts have always been with our customers, okay, understanding their their situation. Um, you know, for a lot of them, they need their money back because uh, they themselves are in difficult situations. But I think I think where everyone lost track of it is that in normal circumstances, you know, like if I take the Thomas Cook scenario, which was at the time, if you remember, reported as the biggest failure in travel in our industry in the UK mm -hmm. by a long way. You know, we managed perfectly well across Travel Republic and the other brands and B2B to do the well within the 14 days. Because if I take Travel Republic, it was 10% of the packages uh, had a Thomas Cook flight. So when 90% that were carrying on with other airlines, there's business coming in. Um, and therefore, your, your, our business is built to be able to manage that. What happened in the middle of March was just a completely different situation whereby not only did within three days literally bookings dry up that wasn't the biggest issue is that at that point in time when the lockdown came in the next four weeks included easter departures one of the peak points of the departures and i looked actually at our cash flow then as in of all those forward bookings the monies received from clients in full 70 percent of that had been paid out to an airline so it wouldn't have mattered whether you, if you had a trust account or some other scheme, that would have paid out to that airline, right? Because you're allowed, to, that's what the scheme allows you to do, is to use the money for the supplier. Right. That's tens of millions of pounds in our case that was out there with the supplier. And the problem happened is that in those two weeks, 
it was complete mayhem. No one knew how long it was going to last. We, some of us were, some people were thinking that the June events would carry on. Mm -hmm. The May events may even carry on. We're now, you know, way past that. Mm -hmm. And I think the situation is it, people overreacted too quickly and we should have really closed ranks, not against anyone, but to work together on it, to get an understanding of the situation everyone was in. And even the good companies that say they're refunding, they're not refunding within 14 days. A lot of them are, are beyond that because of the whole the pot of money that's been used to pay those airlines. It has to come back in until we know what's happening. So that's what we had to do is work on our timings and work out what was going to happen when, so then we could put a plan together. And I think we should have come together and work with the government on trying to buy time and secure and give customers reassurance that their money was safe. And if the government got behind it, the consumer would have relaxed a bit more, would have you know not panicked so much. And then you could have handled the few that were desperate for their money for personal reasons and, and cash reasons. Because as of today, we have customers who are very relaxed about it. You know, taking the credit note. Yeah, and even well, even though we got out and said we, you know, we started the refund process, some of them write into us go, "Oh, thanks so much, great. I didn't expect it so quickly," because they know the situation. But obviously, some people are in an awkward place where they need the money. Yeah. And really, we should have separated that out and dealt with the people who need the money, but then also try and buy time. And if the government got in behind it, I think it would help the whole industry. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, John. Um, Gary, what about you? I mean, TTNG has. Uh, over a thousand members, isn't it? Tell us what your view are is with all regards to your thousand member agencies. Well, I think we need to be really clear between the difference between a travel agent and a tour operator and an airline. So making the different arguments for each, but they're all interconnected and the, the pipeline is pretty clear on how the money flows, whether you're operating a trust account as our TGA members do, or whether you're a world choice member under ABTA and Atoll, um, or even if you're a home working business, it doesn't matter where you are in that pipeline, you're all interconnected and connected. So coming together and having a clear understanding of what the issues, um, actually, um, everybody ran in fear in that first five, four, three weeks. Um, everybody was looking at their own businesses, worrying where and of what are we going to do? Um, and we all got hope through the furlough schemes and the government interruption loans, all those other things. But it was really clear, very simply, that there was no money in the pipeline to do refunds within 14 days. If the money was in the pipeline, you still could not have done the refunds within 14 days simple you just haven't got the haven't got the capacity to cope with that level of refund um it was very clear early on that there had to be some real leadership and guidance um around, among the associations um we spoke with abta abta spoke with the caa there was real clear conversations between the caa abta and we supported those in what we had to do to get um clarity we needed to get the government to change their to amend the package regulations, as Europe was saying, and was already doing, and giving countries across Europe the ability to amend the package travel regulations. So Europe was giving guidance around that. And we had to do two things. The first thing was tell government exactly what it would mean in the event of mass insolvencies. And the second thing was to give our members the ability to have the right conversation with the customers. So the refund credit note um, was a thing of um, pure clarification to a consumer to help members have a customer and also what we did not want to do in a crisis was remove the customer's right to a refund mm. so if i get back to your question where do we sit as an industry um we have had the most moronic conversation in the trade when we're not discussing or debating what the real issue is the real issue is is nobody is saying the consumers should not have a refund Mm. No, nobody is saying the consumer should not have the right to refund within 14 days. Nobody's saying that. The reality is it is practically and physically impossible to do that. And it will cause mass insolvencies where consumers won't get their money back. So to have a di discussion debate is just not understanding or running a, a conversation for your own small agenda and not actually the whole industry's responsibility of the difference between an agent and a tour operator and the airlines. We all know where that money is. We all have to have a grown up and honest conversation. The refund credit notes allowed members, agents and tour operators to have an honest conversation with their consumers without moving their rights. Mm -hmm. And it enabled over 70% of consumers to be moved to a later date to keep them within the system whilst giving them the ability to understand the plight of an industry that had come to a grinding halt. So to, ha to, to have a discussion about it, I just thought was crazy. And that's the key thing. A lot of consumers are happy to, to be moved, moved uh, have their holiday booking moved on. It's just that there are a lot of vocal 
perhaps more vocal people that, that aren't. And obviously there have been certain people within the travel industry challenging this. Um, obviously this situation might never have arisen if the government had listened. I mean, we said, Gary, you said these conversations were going on very early on. Why hasn't the government listened? What needs to happen to make the travel industry being seen seriously by the government? How can we stop well, this happening again? Uh, well, um, the uh, the learning curve for us all, and we've debated it and debated it, and we all have to take responsibility, not just blaming ABTA or blaming the CA. We all have to take responsibility, whether you're a, a travel agent or tour operator. If you have an opinion, then get involved and take some responsibility on that. And that responsibility around um, long-term relationship with government and influencing government and we have to effectively get behind one body, even when sometimes it conflicts with our own individual responsibilities, because it's been clear once again that the airlines are far more organised and far more powerful because they are far more important to government to be able to have those conversations. But the other thing we need to be able to do is have a lobbying organisation that represents and able to consistently and professionally lobby over a long period of time. And the, the next important thing is to be able to give them clear data that demonstrates our argument. And I think ABTA have done some remarkable things in the last three weeks. I'm, I've, I've historically um, uh, clashed with them from time to time, but um, some of the stuff they've done, John de Vial, uh, Mark Tanza, they have absolutely understood how to get that argument across. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I know in the last six weeks is um, government fundamentally understand the issue. They know that mass insolvencies will fall back on the CA and ATA. They understand that consumers cannot enforce their rights until they get to court. And therefore, they don't need to be seen to be coming down on one side or the other at this point in time mm -hmm. because consumers are not causing the mass insolvencies of travel businesses. Um, they, we have made the arguments, and we, we think both the CAA and government have to come out with a clear statement that, number one, the refund credit notes are financially protected from the CAA. They they verbally given that assurance to yeah, yeah. and ourselves. Um, they have also, uh, they need to come out and say that. Now, I know they've got political masters, but also the government have to um, bias credibility. And where we're losing um, social capital with our customers because of the difference between the law and the reality, mm -hmm. the government can quite easily say, your consumer rights are financially protected, but we are giving the industry sensible time to get that money back down the chain. And the government shouldn't be scared about making that decision because if 70% of customers have already decided to move their holidays, then 70% of customers have fundamentally understood that the industry is in a completely different world to where we are today to where we were six weeks ago. But the government clearly aren't listening. So where, where do we go from here? How do we win back consumer trust? <coughs> it's not about winning back. You know, we've, we've said there are consumers that are listening and understanding. How can we ensure that we retain that consumer trust? Um, John or Joanne, I don't know. I mean, Joanne, you've got customers you're dealing with within your three shops, you know, on the front line. What, what are they saying? It's very much a mixed bag. There is customers who are really happy to take a credit voucher um, and they understand. And I think a lot of it's to do with how we deal with it, mm -hmm. how us as agents and operators are talking to each other, you know, and how we are putting it over to our actual customers and explaining, yeah, this is not ideal. This is not what we want to do. And as an industry, this is not what we've all been born and bred to do, like over 30 odd years in the industry. It's not what I've ever known, but it is circumstances that are out of our control. And it is down to reassuring them that their money is safe, they will get another holiday. Um, and if it comes to the time when the money comes, if they still don't want that voucher, then we can then apply to get them a refund. So we're getting a lot of customers that are totally accepting it. But then again, as Gary says, we've got customers. My shops are very much mass market, bucket and spade, cruise. Um, I'm very much in working class um, villages. We're very much part of the community. We've got great relationships with everybody in the community. So we have been very, very vocal out there with certain people and groups to explain this is what's going on. And they do understand it, but we have got people that need their money now. Um, and, you know, so they've not got a lot of dispensable income and these people we are doing our best to reassure and we're talking to operators who will listen to us and there has been a lot of operators there that have really helped with customers like that to get them their cash refunds and it's not that we're holding back and I think that's what is frustrating me as an agent is the fact that the media out there is very much making out that we are sitting on people's money and we're not. And I think the whole message about the pipeline needs to get out. And, you know, I have done quite a few different things in Scotland through the SPA to get the messages out there. 
but they're only wanting doom and gloom. They don't want the positive side of it and that, that we are helping some customers, you know, and we are getting money through to them. Consumer media, not the trade media. Yeah, not the trade media at all, but as consumer, but, you know, so, you know, I do think there has to be more positive messages out there. Yeah. Um, that we are all fighting to help our customers from an airline, from an operator, from an agent, you yeah. know, we, but we do need to work better together. Certain people, you know, I think have put their head in the sand, if I'm being dead honest, with regards to some agents. Mm -hmm. And I think the agents that are very, very much in touch with their customers and being very honest with them and putting your hands up and saying, yeah, this is not ideal, but this is where we're at and I will look after you. I will get you rebooked. Or if I can't get you rebooked, I'll get your money back. But I think there's people that are just closing down the hatches and kind of frightened to talk to customers. And I think the big thing here is all about communication between an agent and a customer and obviously an agent and an operator. Yeah. John, would you agree with that? Because where, where do you think we go from here? I know obviously post-Cook, um, you had some views about the ways that... Um, not the relationship would change between agents and operators, but in terms of what information you might ask from agents might, might change. Do you still kind of hold on to that view? And how else do you think the industry landscape might change as a result of this? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, we, we almost have got that work done um, before COVID hit. So it's it's almost there. But uh, as an operator, if, you know, this time around, if we'd had more of the uh, customer contact details, would have helped us because some agents uh, literally furloughed the whole company and the customers couldn't get hold of them. So then in the end, they were trying to get hold of the operator because I think a few of them have found out what the atoll certificate actually means. So, although it needs a bit more clarity, but um, so I think if we'd had more contact details, we could have mass communicated out to people saying, relax, you know, we've got your back. We're sorting things out. We'll try and communicate. The biggest challenge, you know, and I, and I sincerely hope this never happens again, is that none of our businesses are, 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 are set up to deal with a hundred percent stop, which is literally that, right? It was ninety plus percent stoppage overnight. I mean, within three days, um, and and this mass, you know, the, the day after the lockdown was announced and the FCO changed to that four weeks of no travel whatsoever none of our phone lines could cope because everyone rang and they ring multiple times so they can't get through. The whole thing clogs up. So, you know, we are thinking ahead as to how we, if this happens again, um, or they are saying when, if this thing comes back every winter, I hope not. Um, how do we cope with that? Because one of the things that we weren't best at is communicating back to our clients and our agents fast enough on our position. Um, we hadn't got this in our business continuity plan. You know, what happened was is we were slightly ahead of the curve. So about a week before we had the, a case in Travel Republic or even a couple of weeks. So we had to shut down the office. And ironically enough, I had been, I'd had a management meeting on the Friday saying, this thing's serious. We need to be prepared for it. We may have to shut down an office and clean it if a case comes. And there was a couple of chuckles on the phone people going out oh, come on john don't be over dramatic on the monday night we shut the office um literally that close and then i had several colleagues from the industry contact us afterwards saying wow how did you go about it what did you do what was your who did you use for your cleaning you know um what was your processes and that kick-started our ability then to move people to home working and that was about 300 people in Travel Republic. And it wasn't perfect for that week because our VPNs weren't ready, but within a few days, the tech guys sorted it out. I didn't realize that a few weeks later, we'd be doing that to 30 hundred people. And they were literally grabbing taxis, sticking the hardware into their taxis, driving home, setting it up, and then IT guys remotely contacting them, making sure they could connect to the systems, uh, boosting up our VPN connectivity, because suddenly you've got in Leyland, you know, 600 people trying to connect remotely into the building when we only had it provisioned for 200, which seemed excessive at the time. So all your plans go out the window. So while we're doing all this, we're also then trying to worry about the customers, what should we be doing, what the policies are going to be doing. And I think, you know, the guys who criticise and sit there saying, you know, I managed to refund my, my, my customers uh, in no time at all. Great, you know, but a lot of our 
for the bigger businesses, you know, it had to go through such change at such rapid rate. Um, so I think our learning from that is that will be part of our, you know, emergency plans now going forward. We now know we can do it. I think we will leave an awful lot of people with the hardware at home and actually buy new, new uh, systems in the office because uh, we don't know how that going, you know, the repatriation is going to work, probably all the social distancing and all that means we'll have fewer people in the office and we'll, we'll change the way we work completely. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it was a hell of a shock. Um, I think we did as well as we could in the circumstances. Um, we've had some nice feedback from agents and from the, you know, the agency community on, on how we've, we've certainly got to grips with it in the latter weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously the news of refunding always makes people, <coughs> is yeah. how we've given people the choice. And in some businesses, we're not quite at the numbers that Gary's got to, unfortunately, but we've got, you know, 40, 50% of people who have accepted the, the refund credit notes and are quite relaxed about it. And, and they're starting to convert as and when they wish to uh, into a future holiday. So a lot of learnings out of this, yeah. but it's been one hell of a journey. Yeah, I guess one of the frustrations has been as well in that there's not been a definite time frame um, given by anyone, and, and not to blame after at all, but I think there was a frustration that we know what isn't reasonable. We know that the 31st of March isn't reasonable, and after I said that's not reasonable to, to refund by then, you know, you can't give yourself a year. We don't know what is reasonable. So at first it was the end of July, but as we move ever closer to that date, that obviously changes. Is there a frustration from, from you three in that there should be clearer guidelines and perhaps whoever the role is, you know, we're not going to get anything from, from government. Does the industry need to collaborate together and decide, right, this is what reasonable looks like? Because agents are telling me that they're really confused by the mixed messaging from operators, and a whole variety of operators who are saying different time frames, all of whom believe that's perfectly reasonable. Yeah, so I, I think, that, let me just come in there, because we're obviously, we've got 1,023 members. We've also got 170 business partners, and you know, John and Scott Metal Travel too um, are a really important one of those business partners. And we've seen behaviours completely different across the whole range of those 170 business partners. Um, ABTA, the CA, and ourselves um, came out with pretty clear guidance very early on, which was effectively a rolling six months to the 31st of July. Was um, was whether it was reasonable or what it was just the reality that if we did it any earlier we'd see a whole round of failures. Um, by ABTA moving their guidance and I think they've moved their guidance too at the end of your bond renewal period um, has given some real confusion around that. And I think there does need to be some clarity around that about what is reasonable. Clearly, um, travel agents are seeing for themselves what is reasonable and they're seeing that with angry customers. So when they're having a conversation with a customer, and we and I won't name and shame them because we haven't publicly named and shamed any of our business partners, but we've had really strong conversations with them privately to say that is not reasonable. And the majority of business partners, um, especially after the crisis of the first three weeks, um, are taking issue with exceptions of consumers of a certain age or a certain hardship position, so they are taking that into account. Um, but you know, clearly 2022 is not reasonable. No. Um, and, 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 and clearly um, where you've got business partners buying that time, um, we just think yeah, that's simply not fair. They have got the abilities to go. Yeah, we've seen, we've seen very few by the way, but, um, and certainly not, um, um, gone over trouble too, but there's only, there's only really been three business partners that have come out with real clarity that really support the agents. And I can name, you know, um, you know, I'll certainly name John as one of those, but in the first crisis, we understood why they couldn't get to a point of giving real clarity. Mm. And that first crisis, when you're dealing with all of those repatriations and the um, people working from home and you're terrified that there's no end in sight and you, you could simply go out of business because you have no cash. Mm -hmm. Every single business partner has been through that fear as every single travel agent is. So I think those who are sensible and reasonable and rational and understand this industry inside out are not going to shout and scream at business partners for what they did in that first week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. But we're now six weeks into the crisis and good businesses are very clear on what their cash projections are, what their risks are, what their next six months to 12 months look like. And, and we believe there'll be no travel this year outbound in the uk um, we believe it will come back for 2021 and i'm hoping i'm completely wrong but that's what we're preparing for um so um, for businesses who are looking out for two years a year and a half to do those refunds that's simply not acceptable it's not responsible abtra saying that's wrong the ca is saying that's wrong and um you know we're saying that we will enforce our code of conduct against those those businesses to ensure that they get pulled up 
but the reality is they're not going to get pulled up properly until the consumer gets the ability to enforce their rights Mm. and the consumers will enforce their rights through the courts and when they get access to the courts then those companies are going to have to see very quickly what they're doing with those refunds because it's not acceptable to just push them away or simply say no at that stage and it is those bad apples that are giving the whole industry a bad name i mean joanne you know would you agree with that so you're not definitely um i do think you know from an SPA point of view, we, we're speaking to a lot of agents, um, so not just my own, obviously my own business, but from an SPA point of view, you know, there's been a lot of agents come on to us and we've done a survey with regards to, you know, a set, few certain things and one of the big ones is with regards to credit notes and the dates and the validity on them. And the big thing is that that is not acceptable to be as long as that, you know, we the, the ones that we were working with was a lot of to the end of July and we could get customers accepting that and our hope was that, you know, when we did eventually get opened up or when we had were able to bring staff off of furlough, the majority of agents were saying we'll get customers when we start to talk to them, when we interact again, we'll get them rebooked for next year with these credit notes, but to give them, you know, for two years is just not acceptable and customers, they think we're at it. If, be perfectly honest they do think the whole industry is at it and that is not the case so it is only a few because the majority in fairness that we've dealt with um they have been very understanding as gary said you know when you go to them with specific things with regards to people that are elderly that can't go again and we do need to try and get the refund then we are getting them so there is a lot of people out there being you know really good with regards to helping us but we have got people out there also from an agency point of view that are screaming about things and it's tarring the whole industry and it's not fair you know, it really isn't fair when we have got so many partners out there that are really, really working hard to help, to help us and help our customers. So, yeah. yeah. So how do we move forward? What, what happens now? You know, do we think that the financial protection landscape is going to alter drastically? You know, Gary, obviously you're a massive advocate for, for travel trust accounts. Um, you know, do we think that that's going to be the way forward and most businesses are going to adhere to that? Will we see customers not wanting to book, or sorry, agents not wanting to book airlines for their customers and telling their customers to book airlines directly because they're worried that they might not get the money back if this happens again? John? Well, like I, I, I am as well, I'm a trust, my, my business is um, Advantage Managed Service, so I, I operate a trust account. Um, and I do, I'm an advocate of it because I'm used to it and I know where my money is and my customer's money stayed. But I think we need to look at, you know, not, there's been a lot of things in the press saying that agents are using, you know, pipeline money. They're not all doing that. There's some fabulous agents out there that have been going for a long, long time who work their business like a trust account and they don't touch that customer's money. And I think that needs to be made a bit more clearer because, again, it's making out that, you know, agents that have been, you know, an apt agent for a long time, you know, this is what they're doing. They're living on that customer's money. That's not the case. And I know that Mm. because we've got lots in Scotland that I've spoke to. Um, But I do think it will be different. I think it'll be a completely different landscape out there with regards to um, how we will operate. You know, I think there will be quite a lot of people that will maybe decide this isn't what they want to do anymore with regards to being a full APTA agent. Do they go over and move into a trust account type environment? I think there will be a lot of that happening. I do. John, you were going to... Sorry, I think it has to change. Um, I I actually think that um, it's probably about time. We keep talking about, you know, should the all the bonding scheme and everything else be looked at you know the difference between the yeah, seat only the packaging room only all that kind of stuff you know we struggle to keep up with our own industry's um kind of regulations and i think it wouldn't be a bad time to sort of get a group of people together and um and work with with government bodies and uh up to and so on 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 what that should look like going forward um replacing the atoll scheme or everything i just think the whole bonding everything because ultimately you know if there are companies out there who really were just living off of the the cash and and are now probably in a really really bad situation um then that's giving us all uh a bad reputation and 
you know, it's basically you're, you're running a business with other people's money all at risk. If anything happens, you've got no way out. So if we have to, then the only way to, to change that is making that license uh, renewal much more difficult. And, you know, but I, I haven't got the answers. I think the trust account is, is definitely one uh, clear option. Um, but, you know, it's not an easy thing to put in place if you're not there already. So there's got to be ways of getting to that position where, you know, businesses are more financially secure. The customer's money is, is more secure than it is today. I mean, Gary, you've seen an impressive rise in the number of people inquiring about trust accounts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, the Travel Trust Association has been going for over 25 years. It's a, it's a unique proposition still because um, we have a managed service proposition, but unlike um, uh, like the, the Future Freedom model or the Advantage Managed Service proposition, it's not one central trust account. So with, with Future Freedom, you saw the challenges around a trust account. A trust account on itself doesn't work. If you just have a trust account and your grandma is the trustee, it doesn't work. There has to be more than just a simple trust account. And, um, you know, the reason why the regulation has to change isn't just because of COVID-19, it's because of Thomas Cook. Thomas Cook was um, um, a horror show. Um, it's taken all the money out of the Air Travel Trust Fund. Mm -hmm. um, we've gone from bonds to APC. And the bonds to the APC move all those years ago meant that there was a huge amount of surplus money in that air travel trust fund that has now all disappeared. Yeah. So how you regulate small businesses and how you regulate large businesses is what we have to grapple with. What John references is the, the complication around regulation for those big businesses and what they have to do and the hoops they have to jump through to be and, and get regulation. I know the stress these businesses go through their annual renewal with their CA at all license and the complications around cash, net free assets and all those other things. And that is around complicating and controlling um, how much capital is in those businesses. But one of the things that we also got to recognise is we have had an incredibly successful travel industry that's coped with huge, enormous stresses in it, ash cloud, failures, frauds, all that stuff. Um, and the consumer is paying less now for some of their holidays than they were 15, 20 years ago. And, it, and the other thing as well is you've got to have an industry that is dynamic, so it enables new players into that market and they are creating the new businesses that are allowing them to compete. And it's, you're, not just, you're not just raising the barrier of entry to stop that dynamism coming into the industry. So the established players dominate and control those markets. Mm. The CA and the government have to grapple with that and have been trying to for a long time. Um, one of the ways they tried to grapple with it was by bringing in the trust account model and um, the managed service propositions. And the CA were looking at one stage to simply regulating the top 100 ATO holders mm -hmm. and allowing a trust account model to regulate everybody underneath that. So there are different models that we can apply. The APC did do some remarkable things. It gave a huge amount of cash to enable them to cope with some massive losses. Whereas before the APC, the old bonding, people were still paying high bonding and higher regulated, but there was no money in, in the Air Travel Trust Fund to pay those monies. So I don't think we should throw the bath, the, the, the baby out of the bathwater, yeah. whatever that terrible thing is. Um, but what we do have to recognise is um, in the same way in 2008 that the government's asked the banks to recapitalise, mm -hmm. they're going to look at our industry and go, what are you doing with consumers' cash? You've been at the forefront of the noise um, in terms of complaints and consumers. And what are you doing? And I think it's absolutely terrible for consumer for, for our industry to talk about Ponzi schemes and criticism of pipeline money. That is just simply not true. We are absolutely a, an industry that um, has, has, has always gone out and out of their way to support consumers through crisis and, pr and problems and self-regulate. It's, it's our APC money we're paying into the Air Travel Trust Fund. It's not coming from anywhere else. We're self-regulating that. Um, but there are some real advantages around, specifically, I mean, I'm going to recommend the Travel Trust Association model because it's got 25 years. It financially protects everything, accommodation, only car hiring. You don't need net, you don't need free assets in your business. You can run it with no net free assets because you're not using the consumer's money to do it in a particular way. Mm -hmm. But even with that trust model, with you have to compete. You're still releasing money from that trust early where it's going to atoll holders or where you're using supplier or blend of insurances to release it. So you're still um, using the money up the pipeline, which means at a time when the whole industry comes to a grinding halt, you are still having to wait for money to come back down the pipeline to mm -hmm. repay, the, repay those consumers. So um, even in trust accounts, you still don't get the ability to simply use the consumer's money to refund where you've got it protected up the chain, if that makes sense. Yeah. 
Well, it's clear that we need to bring airlines as well, perhaps, into this any protection scheme that we do to ensure that, you know, there isn't money there. It, it's not... Could I just, so, just on that, so, um, uh, again, it's a, and it, we've got to be honest and debate that. So, um, yeah, the industry, you know, we're talking about the reputation of our industry. The reputation of each one of your businesses will depend on the relationships you have with your business, irrespective of um, ABT to putting their head above the parapet or the Travel Trust Association putting their head above the parapet and taking collateral damage from consumers blaming our industry or shouting loud. Hold to the fact that 70% of consumers know they've moved their, their bookings on. And I, you know, the conversation I have, they understand that we're in a completely different world. The airline have to refund within seven days. They've stopped refunding. Mm. So under the in the under the European uh, regulatory 261 or whatever it is, you know it better than I do. You know, they're not doing that. So they're taking a huge collateral damage. Mm. But if if financial protection has historically been a defining factor in giving confidence for businesses, then do we want airlines to have that? Do we want airlines to come into our regulatory process and, and get the same sort of benefits around financial protection? Because then they will come into package holidays and all the other things and have the same type of risks we would. So yeah. I'm, I'm not saying no, but I'm saying you, you've got to be careful about what the benefits and disadvantages are to bring the airlines in and therefore compete against the unique industry that we have, mm -hmm. that ecosystem of outbound travel with at all and financial protection. It's a good point. I think this discussion could go on and on. Indeed, it probably will continue uh, on for the next year or couple of years. Um, I am conscious of time, so we're going to have to wrap this up and move to uh, the live Q&A. But I know we're going to have a number of questions uh, for all of you. So thank you again for today. Thank you again to our panel. Uh, they are going to be joining us all now very shortly. Um, just a reminder to use the Q&A function rather than the chat function um, for any questions you might have. I mean, this is a, a really... Uh, a debate that many feel really passionate about. I mean, we could see Gary in particular was uh, particularly passionate about. Um, it, it is such a, a hot topic at the moment. Um, we've already got some questions coming through. I can see Gary has just joined us, as has Joanne and John. I think all of you are on mute. So I'm just unmuting you all. There we go. There's Gary. Hi, Gary. Um, Hi, yeah. Just, I'm conscious of time, so I'm just going to crack on with the questions. Um, we've had uh, one question come through uh, from Anonymous. What are all your views on chargebacks to agents where they haven't had the pipeline money back to be able to refund it? Um, this is an issue I know that's affecting a lot of agents. Um, Joanne, have you been affected by this? Sorry, I, I missed the start of that. So the, the issue around chargebacks, where, um, yeah. chargebacks to agents where they haven't had the pipeline money back to refund it. Um, I've, I've actually been quite lucky with regards to I've not had any back at all, um, but I do know of quite a few different agents up here who have, and to be honest with you, they have spoke to the bank and obviously says this liability doesn't lie with me, and they have been offered, you know, the credit notes. So um, I have seen quite a few other people that have had it, and it's a bit of a scary one to be honest with you but luckily touch would have not had any just now yeah, but yeah. I just, you know it is it's it's a frightening one but i think there is quite a few of the banks that are actually realizing that you know the situation that we're in and they're not actually putting it right through um so hopefully okay. there won't okay. be as much gary what are your members saying is this a big issue for them uh not really um across our whole um over a thousand members we have had very few chargebacks and where they're acting as an agent, we've already provided our members with uh, legal letters to defend Section 75 and the chargeback issue. So you can absolutely defend the chargebacks um, where you're an agent. It's slightly more difficult where you're the principal. Um, and it's one of the reasons why we're not seeing mass insolvency from the tour operators, because the chargebacks are not sweeping through like we expected them to do. Uh, but Joanna's right that the banks have, and the merchant acquirers are very aware of the implications. And we got advice from Visa and MasterCard very early on and we spoke to all of our merchant acquirer relationships very early on just to make sure that they were aware that if we got chargebacks coming through, this is how we're going to defend them and not to take the money immediately, but give us the chance to push the customer down the line. Okay. We've got a question about pricing, which, John, you might be able to help with. Um, someone says the majority of our customers are very understanding and have accepted a refund credit note, only to find that the prices for the same holiday in a year's time are extortionately higher. We're seeing increases of over 20%. Um, which is becoming the normal with some operators. Is there anything uh, which could be done to prevent this? Um, John, is there a policy that Gold Medal Travel 2 are, are working to on this at all? Or? Well, I mean, of course, <clears throat> it is dependent on um, the, you know, the suppliers, uh, hotels or airlines. Um, 
depending on, I mean, some, some of the airlines, you know, haven't completely decided on their pricing policies for next year. So I think the issue currently is that until that settles down and they, you know, everyone understands kind of what the volume will be like, um, they've probably got some standard pricing out. Mm -hmm. However, you know, there are um, a couple of interesting schemes that if customers are on Emirates um, tickets and they decide to take the swap, like the credit on, the, on Emirates, you can actually swap the flights for the same region you are going to um, any time right up until the very end of next year, in fact, into 22, um, at no extra charge. So we have been communicating that out uh, via Gold Medal and Travel 2. But look, I think it's a bit, at the moment, it's a, it's a case of a little bit of supply and demand, and that hasn't settled down yet. So some routes are cheaper. Um, in some places, they just haven't quite got around to deciding what that yield or the pricing mechanism will look like. So you've got to look for the deals. Uh, some of the hotels are doing some good offers and we have got some good offers that we're pushing through gold medal and travel to. Okay, thank you. Um, for a question from Lee, he says, we're particularly frustrated about this refund issue. Um, we are trying to follow the 14 day refund rule. Obviously they're being beholden by operators, but they're saying that operators are insisting clients go down the insurance route. The insurers are passing it back to the agents to go back to the operators and this vicious cycle is continuing. Um, Gary, are you seeing this? Because they're saying that the client then takes the chargeback, so it goes back to the chargeback issue. But are you seeing this just issue with members about the insurance side of things, where it's going back to the insurers and then having to come back to the agent? Well, certainly, um, if uh, a travel agent is able to push the consumer back to their travel insurance policy and the insurance policy pays out, not only do you protect the pipeline, you protect your margin as well. So um, we have actively talked to our members and put and set up a section where they can bring consumers who have travel insurance policies and, and check whether their travel insurance will cover them for cancellation, curtailment, uh, where they might be a key worker. And there's a term within policy that covers that as well. So we've had that conversation with our members and set up a process to support them with those conversations. And we've seen some real successes of sending customers back to their travel insurances to get their payment straight away and obviously if they get the payment from the travel insurance they've got coverage in that insurance policy um, there is I think we've covered over 63 different types of insurance policies and there's a variations on all those T's and C's and whether they are or cannot be covered around that so I would ask and act and say have a look at the travel insurance policy and see if you can push it down that route now clearly their first legal right from the consumers under the package travel regulations that doesn't go away but with the world at a stop and we know that you're not going to get your refund within 14 days it is obviously an opportunity but just to come back to your, your chargeback issue, Sophie, that isn't an issue. You should be able to defend that through uh, the right legal letters with your merchant acquirer. So I don't see it as a rounded cycle. Um, it's an honest conversation with your customers say, you have a number of routes and this is the best route now. The next best route is to um, get a refund credit note. And the next best route is to pursue the refund if that's exactly what you insist upon. Okay. Um a slightly different one, but someone's obviously just looking forward about how this crisis might change the way that uh, agents and operators work with their clients. They're saying, do you think that in the future, operators and travel agents will be obliged to offer their customers a live chat communications app to improve how they stay in touch before, during and after their holiday, especially if there is another crisis? I mean, Joanne, a lot of agents obviously offer a 24-7 um, phone line anyway. I don't know if, if you yourself do, but they're obviously saying about this live chat app. What do you think? Is that something that you might want to implement? Um, well, I think there is some people do that just now, but um, it's not one that I would do, no. Because <laughs> I, I think I've had enough of um, working till 12 o'clock at night just now. Um, but yeah, I think, I think there is probably a lot of people out there, especially, you know, maybe agents that are doing their own thing and, you know, they want to be there for their customers when they're in resort and whatever, but no, I don't know. I think some people might want to do it. I'm kind of social media zoomed out, if I'm being honest, and I'm looking forward to being back to doing face to face. But I do think there is an opportunity and I think people will definitely use, you know, a lot of the, the stuff that they've been using like this to communicate with their customers. Um, but and home workers, I know a lot of home workers that currently do it anyway um, mm. and do it very successfully. But I think from my point of view, I'm very much a high street agent and I want my customers still coming in. Um, we do contact them if we need to and they've got, you know, emergency numbers. But I don't really want to be 24-7 with my customers, if I'm being brutally honest. <laughs> That's fair enough. Um, and finally, just one last point. Um, back to this refund issue. 
is it down to the way airlines and tour operators have been funding their business out of customer holiday funds, someone says, rather than business capital? And I know this is an issue that you touched on, um, John, in terms of how the protect, financial protection landscape might change. They say it's not fair that the government, to, to say the government isn't listening, it's more that the industry must revisit itself and the way that it funds itself. I mean, that well, comes back to the issue we discussed, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, some, some companies may, but um, I think a lot, a lot aren't. The, the biggest situation in here was what I explained um, before is that, you know, when you, when this happens just before the, one of the peak departure points uh, of Easter, um, not forgetting that that's at the time when the airfares are the highest because it's school holidays. So the airfares actually making up a huge percent, you know, a percentage of the package holiday. Um, those funds were paid out. We paid all our suppliers on time. Um, and therefore, you know, it's not like, you know, if, if I've got to get the money back for, for Gary's booking, it's the money is gone out. So I thought I'll to go and borrow someone else's money, but so it's not like we're sitting on, on the money and haven't paid the supplies, you know, 70% of all of the booking, the, the monies for, for those bookings for the Easter departures was, was uh, already paid out to suppliers. Yeah. So it's, um, no, I'd say that, you know, most companies um, are working perfectly normally. It's, it's just an unfortunate timing and the sheer volume of it. Yeah, yeah. All right, thank you so much. Like, I'm, I'm conscious of the time and I know we could discuss this forever, but thank you very much to all three of you for joining today. I really do appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and that's it from us, uh, sadly. Uh, I feel like we could have spent a lot more longer uh, talking about a lot of um, those points. I know we had a lot of questions. Sorry again that we couldn't get through all of them. Um, but I do hope that you found today to be insightful and most importantly useful for supporting your business over the coming months. Um, I say this every time, but at TTG, we really, really do want to continue doing everything we can to support you during this time. So please do get in touch and let us know what else we can be doing to help you and your business. Um, don't forget our coronavirus business support forum is also available with our panel of experts ready to answer your questions and next week we have the all new TTG Digital Destinations Festival um, which is featuring a host of suppliers, uh, Facebook masterclasses, virtual networking, a seminar hosted by our group editor Pippa Jacks which starts at Monday at 10.30 a.m. Um, focused all about where the UK travel market is likely to recover from the worst of the coronavirus crisis and how destinations can best prepare to adapt to consumer demand. So do register for free to attend that. tgdmedia.com forward slash DestFest is the address. Um, back to this afternoon, we're going to be sending out a survey shortly. We really do value your feedback. Uh, it really helps us in shaping the content as we move these seminars forward. So please do take it and let us know your thoughts in the sessions that you want to see. Um, and just a, a reminder as well that to help us to continue providing online, online seminar content such as this, um, we are asking delegates to consider making a donation um, to have attended today with 20% of all contributions going to that all important NHS charities together. Um, just visit ttgmedia.com forward slash contribution um, if you do want to make a donation and thank you very much uh, to those that do. So all that's left for me to say is to have a fantastic bank holiday, um, continue to stay safe, to stay well uh, and stay tuned to TTG for all of the latest news and business support. Thank you very much to all of you. <laughs>